we're in called Deeper Discipleship. Who can forget that stellar drama we had when it was uh, de- described that it's easier to stay on the bank and play it safe than to follow Jesus into the deeper waters for adventure. We also talked last week that we need to be trained. Uh, we're, we've been too, too accustomed to the safety of the land. We need to be trained to be able to navigate the deeper waters. So we talked about how if Jesus were to come in here and sit right beside us, we would love it for a while, then we get uneasy because we knew there would be things that would make us a bit uncomfortable because we didn't measure up. Uh, we knew that there are times when we, well, are on the table that Jesus turns over and we, we need to do the interior uh, searching that is part of discipleship, deeper discipleship. Today we're going to take that one step farther and we're going to learn an interesting lesson from one of the most fascinating stories and downright weird stories that's found in the Gospels. It is the encounter of Jesus with a demoniac, someone who uh, in our phraseology would be crazy, would be beside himself, out of control. There are many different elements in this story, and I would invite you to listen for the, the different ones that might strike you especially. Hear now this fascinating story, and you may remain seated. Jesus and his disciples sailed to the Gerasenes land, which is across the lake from Galilee. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, a certain man met him. The man was from the city and was possessed by demons. For a long time, he had lived among the tombs, naked and homeless. When he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down before him and then shouted, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. He said this because Jesus had already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had taken possession of him, so he would be bound with leg irons and chains and placed under guard, but he would break his restraints and the demon would force him into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had entered him. They pleaded with him not to order them to go back into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. Jesus gave them permission, and the demons left the man and entered the pigs. The herd rushed down the cliff into the lake and drowned. When those who tended the pigs saw what had happened, they ran away and told the story in the city and in the countryside. People came to see what happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully dressed and completely sane. They were filled with awe. Those people who had actually seen what had happened told them how the demon-possessed man had been delivered. Then everyone gathered from the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave their area because they were so overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and returned across the lake. The man from whom the demons had gone begged to come along with Jesus as one of his disciples. Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell the story of what God has done for you. So he went throughout the city proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. And let us pray. Lord, you are faithful as the sun goes up and as the sun sets. Thank you for being present in this service, and please pour a portion of your spirit in the words about to be spoken and heard into that which will be thought and felt, so that in all ways we honor the living Christ in our midst. Amen. So which part of the story grabbed you? Was it the description of that demoniac, the the real strong guy, uh, like if if you have an AARP card, guy look like like uh, uh, Schwarzenegger, or if you're of the younger generation like me, someone that look <laughs> someone that might look like John Cena or uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, was that what struck you? Or was it that weird way that Jesus cast the the demons into the pigs that? became the first recorded instance of deviled ham. That's an oldie but a goodie. Love that joke. Or did you get caught by the strange fact that it said 
all in the region came out and asked Jesus to leave. Not just a few, but everyone in that region came out and said, please leave, you're scaring us. So what was it that caught you? Well, like you, I've read that many times and have seen many different things in it, but what caught me especially was toward the end. It's this passage, it's this verse. The uh, man from whom the demons had gone begged to come along with Jesus as one of the disciples. Jesus sent him away, saying, return home and tell the story of what God has done for you. Did you hear that? He wanted to be a disciple, and Jesus turned him away. That's odd. Peter and Andrew, James and John, the two fishermen, sets of brothers, why, they didn't know much about Jesus at all. And Jesus invited them, hey, come, follow me, I'll make you, I'll I'll fish the deep waters with you if you come with me. And they just went. And now here is someone who knew Jesus much better than they. Here's someone who had been changed by him witnessed internally the power of Jesus, and he begs Jesus to let him be a disciple, a follower. The Greek word translated beg gives the, uh, the, the sense or has a sense of one who continually pleads, continually, please, please, please let me follow you. And the answer, no. No. Why does Jesus turned away someone who desperately wanted to be with him. As I wrestled with that and prayed over it and read commentaries and all that, it strikes me that there is probably one really good cause for this, on, on what at least on the surface looks pretty, pretty cold from Jesus' standpoint, I guess. And that is this. Let's compare the disciples uh, to this man who was refused the the privilege of being called a disciple. Peter and Andrew, James and John, they had families. They lived in nice homes or homes, uh, probably had kids, had a steady job. Uh, They had their place in society. Jesus calls them so they would follow him and they would learn different things. They would uh, know how to be better people. They would know about God and eventually they would witness the resurrection and then turned from there to be an apostle, apostle, someone sent to proclaim the good news. But this man, he didn't have a home. He had the graveyard. He didn't have clothes. He was naked. He didn't have any respectability, uh, any social graces. He was out of control. And when he met Jesus, all of that changed. And as the, uh, one of the, the great verses of one of the great hymns, reclothe us in our rightful minds. And that man was reclothed, if you will, in his rightful mind. And he put on clothes and sat at Jesus' feet. So tell me, who is a better witness to the power of the gospel? Men who were called by Jesus and eventually learned about him and, and experienced him, or one who at that moment changed, was changed instantly and knew and experienced the power of the gospel, the power of the inbreaking kingdom. Who better than to, uh, to be the witness than someone who was close to Jesus and felt the power? Who better? And which are you? Which am I? Are we the respectable fishermen? who accepted the call, and that was pretty brave? Or are we the abnormal character, out of control, and socially unacceptable? Well, on the one hand, as I look around and as I look at a mirror, we're more like the fishermen, right? But the good news for you today, and for me today, is the fact that we're all insane. Welcome to the nut house. We are. Because let's be honest, there are part of ourselves that are out of control. We like to put on the veneer 
that we have it all together, but there's part of us that knows that there are, we might not call them demons, but there are forces that we can allow in that, that disrupt the nice, the nice painting that we're trying to paint of our lives. Some have physical addictions, alcohol, drugs. Some are addicted to pornography, to gambling, out of control in those areas. Others of us have that, uh, that tendency to maybe to be overly angry, overly pessimistic, overly uh, vengeful. Who knows? Every one of us, to be human, knows that within our spiritual DNA, there's always some chain that is broken. And we experience more than we like what it's like to be naked in that graveyard ranting. We're not the people we want others to see us as. All of us want to be able to take a paintbrush and paint a picture of our lives. We want that picture to be so beautiful, don't we? With everything symmetrical, all the colors just right, so that we can take that painting and say, look, here we are, this is us. And the reality is, that as we try to, to get the lines down and the shading and the, and the colors down, we will always mess up. There will be something in the way we see things, something in what we say, what we do, what we feel, that, that makes that brush twitch. And we see the mess that we have made. The good news for us today is the fact that if we claim to be a Christian, then we also claim that there is someone much better than ours, than ourselves, in the ability to paint. And that is, of course, the master. Did you know that in the art world, especially with the old masters of centuries ago, uh, there is something that's called a pentimento. Pentimento. That means that that was a mistake that the original artist made. Maybe it was the, uh, an idea that they started with but then gave up on it. Or maybe it was a color that they chose that wasn't appropriate. And instead of just throwing away the canvas, the pentimento it was that beginning mistake that the master was able to, to take and turn into something beautiful. And as the centuries passed, some of these paintings, the, the overlay of the paint comes transparent, and you can actually see the pentimento, that mistake that the artist made, that's a sign of authenticity. Because what started as a mistake by the master was turned into a masterpiece. The modern equivalent to pentimentos is more in the, the, uh, the burgeoning realm of tattoo artistry. People can make, a, a great tattoo artist can make something gorgeous. But we also know that, well, there are some pretty bad tattoos out there. If you see the A&E show Bad Ink, you will see that, uh, well, one tagline says it all. A man has a bad experience when he mixes alcohol with a novice tattoo artist. I didn't make that up. And I don't want to see the tattoo. But the end of the show is always, you can't even tell the mistake. Because in the hands of the master artist, the mistake is drawn out and is turned into something beautiful. My friends, today we take communion. You are coming to the presence of the master artist. Just like that, that crazy man, that man possessed, that man like us, came to Jesus and found his rightful mind. I simply ask you today that as you prepare for communion, be honest with yourself about those edges of your life that, well, the edges that aren't as clean and crisp as you would like them to be. That, that part of the painting that you messed up, and no matter how many times you try to, to, uh, to change it, it only makes it worse. No, today. That Christianity isn't just thinking nice things and having a, an idea about how to live better. No, Christianity is daring to come into the presence of the living Christ. And in His presence, you put in His hands the brush. And you say, Master, 
I yield to you. Make something beautiful, please, out of that which I have made of my life.